guest speaker today, my son, David Robles. Everybody knows him. Let's give him an applause, a welcome. He was our former youth leader, pastor, and he's brought, he's here today to bring the word. So I'm just going to shut up and let him talk. God bless you guys. God bless everyone. Oh my gosh, that was pretty tough. God bless you, everyone. I'm so, so glad to be back. Um, man, it's been a while, um, and I'm so happy to see a lot of familiar faces. And uh, let's just get right into the word. If we can just open up to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. You actually guys could be seated. I'll let you know and to stand up. I got a, few, a little bit to talk about beforehand. Um, so while you guys are opening up to John chapter 6, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. If you don't already know me, of course, I'm David Robles, the son um, of Pastor Edwin Robles Jr., grandson of Pastor Edwin Robles Sr. And growing up, obviously, as you can tell, church has been a big part of our lives. Christianity has been a big part of our lives. But it wasn't really a big part of my life. I grew up in church um, for about how long? I'd say... All my life, really, as long as I can remember. And it wasn't, it was probably 15 years into my life that I was going to church every single Sunday, every single week, multiple times a week sometimes, sleeping in the middle of rehearsals, and I knew nothing of God, nothing. I knew some guy, some father Abraham, whoever the heck that was, you know, he had many sons, right? But other than that, I did not know much about the Bible, did not know much about God, and some of you are like, well, why the heck are you up here preaching the Word of God? Well, that's why I'm here today to tell you a little about, about what has God has done in my life. And to sum it all up into three different top, three different categories, I guess I would say, is that my life, my testimony, what God has done in my life, it was simple, it was eternal, but it was still a miracle. I'm going to say it again. It was simple, it was internal. And it was still a miracle. A lot of us hear testimonies throughout church and you hear, oh, and and, and praise God for the way that God has moved in their lives. But they didn't work in my life. Sometimes you'll see people come up and they're like, oh, you know, God saved me from a car crash and the heavens opened up and God yanked me out before I could have got hit. Or or, or I I had an illness and and I, I almost didn't make it out of bed, but God saved me. And amen. But that didn't happen to me. And, some, and growing up, me being as ignorant as I was, I'm like, well, God, I'm waiting. I don't know when you're going to do what you got to do in my life. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I don't know what, like, when are you going to show up? When are you actually going to be there in my life where I could testify of your goodness? But I realized at the age of now 22, amen, that it was simple, internal, but I'm grateful that it was still a miracle. How many could say amen? And... Even more so to categorize my testimony, I have to say that I had an issue with my self-identity and my self-worth. Now, I could confidently come up and admit that because I praise God that he's taken me out of that. But all the way up, probably until junior year in high school, I did not know at all what my life was going to look like. Oh, you know, start picking your careers. How many of you, I know a few of you are in high school or just got out of it or just getting into it. You're starting to think about your careers and your future, and you're like, what am I going to do in my life, and this, this, and that. And some of you are certain, some of you aren't. Me, I had no idea. Didn't even have an ounce of passion for anything other than baseball, but I wasn't that good to go to major league, so that wasn't even a question. But I had no idea what I wanted to do. I didn't have a passion for anything. And, you, and I was sitting here with the, a catalog of all these degrees that I could go for. No, no, no. Did not know at all what to do. And it was because I was battling with my self-worth, my self-identity. And one very important word that we hear all the time today is I had low self-esteem. We hear it all the time. Oh, I have low self-esteem. Oh, my eyebrows. Oh, my nail. Oh, I got one of them chipped. You're going to hide it behind your back. Oh, no. So we, we deal with this low self-esteem, and we always, at least me growing up, I don't know about you, I thought low self-esteem was an aesthetic thing. Oh, you know, y'all don't like how I look, I have a low self-esteem, or uh, people are bullying me, I have a low self-esteem. But, I'm, thank God I'm studying psychology, the definition of self-esteem is defined as an individual's sense of his or her value or worth, or the extent to which a person values themselves. So it has nothing to do with aesthetics, it's how 
they value themselves in the world that they are living in. But what do you do when you feel like you have no value? What do you do when you just got laid off of work, you're sick, you're having issues with your family, forget about your friends, you can't even talk to them, you haven't talked to them in years. What do you do when you don't have these things that add up to the value of your life? And I know I'm not the only one that has dealt with this at my age, but I know there's many of us here that has dealt with that. In fact, Dr. Joe Rubino that wrote the book of the, the self-esteem book, 85 of the world's population are affected by low self-esteem, 85% of the world. So I could confidently say eight out of 10 of you here have low self-esteem. It's okay, I'm not expecting you to admit it, but this is a, this is a pandemic in itself. It's an issue, it doesn't get addressed very often. But we all have low self-esteem and we hide it and we mask it behind the things that we have or the things that we think we have. And I was wondering, I was like, God, why is this such an issue in day-to-day -day life? Why is this such an issue year in and year out? There's no, there seems to be no cure to it. And God spoke to me and said that the devil knows if he can attack you, he can attack everything that flows out of you. So if he could attack what you are going through, how you're feeling about yourself, everything that's lived up to the moment that you're standing in and sitting in this chair right now, if he could attack that, he could attack everything that flows out of you. And that brings me, if you're writing notes today, to my first point, and yes, I haven't even told you the title, I haven't even gotten to any Bible verses, it's okay. I'm not a usual type of preacher, pastor, none of that. I'm, if you guys know me, you know me, I'm very different. So my first point, if you're writing it down, how you think will affect how you feel, and how you feel will affect what you do. Now, this isn't just a cute little saying. This isn't just like, oh, Bible. This is actually a lot of people, you know, you may look at me kind of weird when I say this. It's backed up by science, and science is backed up by the word of God. How many can say amen? So, I know a lot of you didn't feel that, but you will eventually watch. Look. So, how you think will affect how you feel, and how you feel will affect what you do, and this is something that affects all ages. I know I've been saying my life when I was younger. I know a lot of us are younger here. There's some that are a little bit older. I'm not going to ask how old you are. It's fine. All We're all young in spirit, amen. So all ages deal with low self-esteem, even adults. So us young people here with our parents, they deal with that same issue too in different ways, but they deal with the same issue. In fact, a study was done on aging adults on their self-esteem. One in every three adults from ages 45 and up struggle with low self-esteem. And in most cases, the study says this, in most cases, these adults are either single, low income, unemployed, or dealing with health problems. I'm like, dang, I mean, that does sound like old people problems. I, I can't relate, you know, I mean, can't be me. Anyways, so, but all of these studies show one common theme is that their low self-esteem is fueled by a lack of something. No health, no intimate relationship, low income, unemployment. And whether you're in here in this room today or you're online, 15 years old, 50 years old, however old you are, you've probably asked yourself this question while dealing with your low self-esteem. And that's our t today's title message, What Good am I? What good am I? So you're like, wow, what kind of, this is kind of depressing. Jeez, you know, all right, well, we're going to get into the word, amen? So if all you could rise, stand to your feet, we're going to get into the word. I give you more work, trust me, more than enough time to open up to John chapter 6, keep us awake. We're going to be talking about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Now some of you are like, oh my gosh, we just read this last week, this and that. Trust me, when I was online, I was hearing the message I was like, oh, shoot, but God's doing something, amen? God's speaking multiple ways in one message, and, and today God is going to give us a double portion of what he wants us to know in this, in this passage. So in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Jesus crossed Lake Galilee, which was also known as Lake Tiberias. A large crowd had seen him work miracles to heal the sick, and those people went with him. It was almost time for the Jewish festival of Passover, and Jesus went up on a mountain with his disciples and sat down. 
when Jesus saw the large crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, Jesus asked Philip, first of all. Like, well, imagine if you're in a situation like this and Jesus asks you, what are you going to do? Jesus asked Philip, where will we get enough food to feed all these people? I mean, hello, Jesus. You're, if you don't know how my, how do you expect me to know? And some of us get put in this situation. You're like, God, I'm waiting for you to do something. What are you going to do? And Jesus asks you the same thing back. And then you're kind of in a stalemate. You're like, well, I still got these 5,000 things to deal with. So verse 7, Philip answered, don't you know that it will take almost a year's wages just to buy only a little bread for each of these people? Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the disciples. He spoke up and said, there is a boy here who has five small loaves of barley bread and two fish. But what good is that? But what good is that with all these people? So there is, you may sit down. So I'm getting ahead of myself. You guys can sit down, relax, take it easy. Don't fall asleep, please. If not, I'll yell again in the mic. I mean, I would be yelling the whole time. There is a young boy with what? Just five small loaves of bread and two fish. That's all he has, right? Five small loaves of bread, two fish. It's not that big of a deal. Feeding all these 5,000, you know, what are you going to do with it? Now, one thing, a disclaimer I want to say, I got a real problem with this boy's lunch, all right? Uh, I, if, if for most of you that know me, I hate fish. I do not like fish. Whoever likes it, you know, you have a, it's, it's, a, it's a superpower. Amen, you could eat it, whatever. I cannot eat fish. I do not like fish. But bread, oh, my gosh, that's the way, that's why I'm built the way I'm built. Like, bread is heavenly. It's beautiful. In some passages, it said it literally fell from the sky. It is straight from heaven. You cannot finish any Hispanic meal without bread. I can't, can't tell me otherwise. So, so much so. Bread is so amazing that even Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. He calls himself bread. Like, come on. If, I mean, if that's the case, I'm going to call myself a steak. You know what I mean? But I'm telling you, bread is amazing. So, that's important to recognize today is that bread is important. Some of you are like, well, what, why are we preaching about bread? We're preaching about low self-esteem. What the heck? This boy. I don't know what's going on. But even Jesus knows how good bread is. Amen? Even Jesus realizes how important this boy's lunch was. So this boy didn't have much, but he was still willing to give it up. You know, how many of you have been in a situation where you're like, you know, usually I'll be playing basketball. It'll be like me and Isaac versus the rest of the guys here. We'll be whooping them like, what, like 20 to 2 or something. The guys are probably like, oh, there's no point of coming back. I, we're not going to get enough points. We're not going to be able to come back. I, if I was the boy in this position, right, if I had five small loaves of bread and two fish, I'll be like, well, yeah, exactly. What good is it? So I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. I can make good use of it, right? I'm going to enjoy this bread. So what good is it to even give it up? And, but the boy was still willing to give it, and in giving it up, there was still people condemning him, saying, what good is he when he has all these people here? And some of us are in this position in our own lives where we're confronted with 5,001, 5,002, 15,000 issues in our lives, and all we got is a small portion of, 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 of anything to get through this trauma, this, this struggle, this issue, and we're saying, what good are we? How can I make it through this? How can I get through what I'm going through when I got all this? Okay, I could pay this bill, but what about the next? Okay, I could get a good grade in this class, but I don't know if that's enough to make me graduate. I don't know what good am I or some of you are wanting to get involved in church involved in Christianity but you're saying I can I got an addiction I'm dealing with this I'm battling with this my family doesn't look that way I don't dress that way I don't smell that way I don't walk that way what good am I to be with them if I'm the way I am and you begin to ask yourself what good are you what good am I what good are you when you are lacking something and in verse 10, the ground was covered with grass. And Jesus told his disciples to have everyone sit down. About 5,000 men were in the crowd. And I want to know why. So 
In the beginning of the passage, if you didn't realize, Jesus told them to sat down before the 5,000 came, right? It wasn't until the issue arose that they're like, what are we going to do about this food? What are we going to do? This and that. Um, oh, shoot, there's a boy. Look, he could take his lunch. What are we going to do? The, they get anxious. I'm, I'm imagining here in this picture that they're like, if Jesus is asking them what to do, they're freaking out probably, right? I would be freaking out. They're like, what am I going to do? I'm going to get this lunch from here. I don't know where I'm going to get it from. Even this is not even enough. What am I going to do? And then Jesus had to tell them again, sit down. So clearly, they were so anxious and so stressed out with what they were going through that they sat down, stood up again, and then Jesus told them to sit down. But why would Jesus tell them to sit down in front of the 5,000 things they're going through when they didn't even solve the issue in the first place? Jesus asked them, what are you going to do to feed these people? Okay, sit down. Like, well, make up your mind. Do you want me to solve it? Do you want to solve it? What am I, you want me to sit down? And some of us are in this position where we're going through mental and emotional turmoil and struggle, trying to make ends meet for whatever we're going through. And Jesus is telling you today to sit down. This isn't a typical message. I'm not here to make all butterflies pretty or to make anyone laugh and smile and jump up and down. If you do that, amen, praise God how you want. But today I need you to know that even though God is standing still, God is asking you what are you going to do, he is also telling you to sit down. Does that still solve the problem though? Okay, we grew up in church. I know a lot of us grew up in church. Just pray about it. Just pray. Just pray. Why don't you believe? Why? Oh, you can't believe like that. You know, you, you got to have faith. You got to have faith. Just the size of a mustard seed. You just got to have faith. But the, the, the problem is still there. The problem is still there. And verse 11, it says, Jesus took the bread in his hands, gave thanks to God. Then he passed the bread to the people, and he did the same with the fish until everyone had plenty to eat. And this brings me to my second point. And I want you to say this along with me. You ready? In the beginning. No, no, again, again. I need you guys to wake up. In the beginning, God's been with me. And I need you to get this in your spirit. In the beginning, God's been with me. God's been with you. And some of you are like, okay, that's nice. That's 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 all nice and dandy. It's, it's you know, it's a little... Bible verse thing that you put a magnet back in your car. God's been with me. All right, that's nice. But I, Dave, I don't think you know what I've gone through. You don't know me. I'm about that. I, you know, you don't know me. Look, look at this. If I could can not convince you, but if I can make you be aware of the word of God today, just follow with me. When Jesus took the bread and initially began to pass it out, how many pieces of bread did he have? He had five. So why would Jesus want it if it was still only five pieces of bread? Okay, right. Even when it was in Jesus' hands, oh, my gosh, put it in God's hands and he'll do a miracle. Okay, we put it in Jesus' hands. Then what? Didn't multiply. Even after Jesus gave thanks for the bread, it didn't multiply. Oh, just be thankful today. Praise God. And, and I don't know about you. Maybe I'm crazy. I sometimes like, oh, I'm going to be thankful, God. I'm going to be thankful in the little so he can bless me in the big. Amen. It didn't multiply even when Jesus himself gave thanks to God. It's not like the rest of the bread fell from the sky or like, oh, my gosh. Amen. Look at this miracle, this beautiful, gigantic, amazing miracle. This miracle was simple. And it says the next verse, then he passed the bread to the people, still didn't multiply. And he did the same with the fish until everyone had plenty to eat. And this is how our lives look like. Listen, listen, follow me, follow me. We go to church today. We're going to be in this service today. I pray God touches you. What happens when we get out of service today? We still have our 5,000 issues to deal with. I'm calling you all guys to sit down. You guys are doing a good job of sitting down, by the way. I'm calling you all guys to sit down, but your issues are still there. 
you hear an amazing word, you're shouting, amen, praise God, you're crying on the altar, you go to winter visit, you go to all these conferences, but you go home to the same issue. You're adding it up in Christianity. Oh, I went to church. I did this. I did that. I did this. I did that. It's going to work. Watch. I'm going to go home. I'm believing, and that's amazing, but what happens when it doesn't happen? What is our posture when it doesn't happen? You accept God into your life believing that he's going to do a miracle in your life, and you go home, you accept God as your Lord and Savior, and you feel the same, you look the same, you smell the same. I mean, I hope you take a shower, but everything's the same. And that's because God doesn't move on our expectation. He moves on his time. And I need us to understand this today because we got to know where did we even get our expectation of God from? Do you know God performed over 40 miracles and not one was done identical to the other? So how can we expect to look at one person's testimony? How can we expect to look at Jeremiah's life, as Isaac's life, and be like, God, you need to do it exactly like that, and I'm not moving until you do it. But maybe God is calling you today to just sit down. Sit down. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what stresses you're having. I don't know what questions you have. It may not be answered today. It may not be answered tomorrow. But Jesus is calling you to sit down. Though you may be lacking, Jesus is calling you to sit down. And God won't do it how we expect it. He will do it how he wants to at the end of the day. And while Jesus himself still didn't have enough bread, he still only had five loaves and two fish, he still had faith to pass it out. It wasn't until he passed out the bread that it began to multiply. It wasn't until he acted within his faith that he began to see breakthrough. And it won't be that case until we do the same. Stop. I don't know who needs to hear this today. Stop waiting for the perfect opportunity because the perfect opportunity will not come. Do Stop waiting for you to look good or sound good or feel good to do something. If you feel called to it, if you have a passion for it, Go after it. I don't care if you have one loaf, five loaves, or 5,000 loaves. I need some of you to get today that God is calling you to move. God is calling you to sit down in front of your problems. God is calling you to confront them directly. No more running away. No more doubting. No more questioning like Philip and Andrew. But no, Jesus is going to call you to sit down and deal with what you're going through. Doesn't sound pretty. I have to deal with what I'm going through. A lot of us don't like confrontation. I mean, me. I mean, I've dealt with a lot with it in my life, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. But a lot of us don't like to deal with confrontation, so what? I don't want to deal with my issues. God's supposed to wipe them clean, right? God's supposed to, supposed to heal me, right? I don't have to deal with them ever again, no? He could, amen, he could do a miracle. He could save you. He could heal you. But we could also fall back into the same hole. We could also deal with the same issues. When you... Newsflash, and a lot of us here can agree with me, just because you accept God as Lord as your Savior does not guarantee you perfection or an easier life. And one thing that, it's not even my notes, but one of the greatest teachings that my dad, I'm not even saying my passion, my dad from uh, a uh, son to father standpoint is that he told me God will not promise you easy, he will promise you victory. And I know some of you have heard that before, but that is so powerful today. God will not promise you an easy life. He will promise you a victorious life. That at the end of the day, though you may be in front of the 5,000 with only your five loaves, uh, uh, Jesus took them from you, I can still guarantee myself victory. And it won't be until we act out of our faith in a struggle uh, or act outside of our struggle and into our faith, excuse me, that we will see him move. So stop focusing on your failures and what you lack or what you can do because that's not where it ends. You got to understand this story doesn't end with just the boy giving the bread to Jesus. It multiplied. It flourished. And that same thing is going to happen in your life if it hasn't already. You got to be willing to give up your five loaves of bread. You got to be willing to give up all you have, your lunch that you had to Jesus so you can see him do what he needs to do in your life. 
That's not where it ends. Someone say that's not where it ends. Oh, come on, please. Come on, guy. That's not where it ends. Come on. Thank you. And we need to add some context to our story. Yes, I may be struggling. Yes, I have a sin. Yes, I have an addiction. Yes, I don't have enough money to make it through this. Yes, I'm having issues day in and day out. Yes, I'm having suicidal thoughts, but that's not where it ends. I have a God that is victorious. I have a God that it will supply. Uh, come on, people. I don't know about you. I don't know if you're sleeping. I have a God that will work it out through me, within me, in where I lack, in where I struggle. God is going to use that. Yes, it may look like I'm not enough. It may look like I don't have enough or I don't look the part, I don't feel the part. But I know it doesn't end there because God's my provider. God is my strength and my weakness. And because I know this, because I know, come on, where my help comes from, I don't have to walk with the low self-esteem or confidence with my head down. I could look up and keep my eyes up into the heels and know that he is sufficient. His grace will come through wherever or whatever I may be going through. With confidence, with strength, with God. Knowing that from the beginning, God's been with me. So you're like, okay, well, this is going to be that I don't know. I don't, I'm not convinced, David. Let's keep it going. You want to know what bread signifies in the Bible? I'm not, some of you may know. There's a whole bunch of different handful of things it means. It signifies, and I thank God we're doing communion today because it thinks it signifies his body, and that's why we're doing communion today. But it also signifies the word. And if it signifies the word, if I go to just literally the same, the same book, very beginning, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So what was God? The word was God. The word was God. The word was God. So the bread signifies the word of God, and the word was God. Does that mean that the bread is God? And if I recall, according to the disciples, the boy had bread with him all along. The boy that lacked had God with him all along. Yes, you may only have five loaves of bread, but God has been there from the beginning with you. Though people may be counting you out, though people may be saying you don't have enough, this boy, what, what good is he with this five bread? I am more than enough because I know God is with me. God is that bread right by me, beside me, from the beginning. How many can say amen? Come on, I'm not shouting out here for no reason. Come on, I need some of you to talk back to me. It needs to be a mutual relationship, amen? So Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the disciples. He spoke up and said, there is a boy here who has five small loaves of barley bread and two fish. What good is that with all these people? But no one recognized, not even the boy, that he had all he needed all along. He had God with him all along. A lot of us look at this verse and be like, it wasn't until God touched it. Amen. But we need to also realize that God's been with us through the beginning. God had his eye with us through the beginning. The boy had his lunch. He was probably going to go home. But Jesus already knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew that he was within that boy all along. And I don't care what sin you're going through. I don't care what addiction you're going through. I don't care what family issues you are encountering today, tomorrow, last year. If it's lingering, I don't care what it is. God is with you and has been with you. Yes, it's only five loaves of bread, but if it's bread, if it's the word of God, if it is God, it is more than enough. And I want you to understand this. If you keep on reading, it says, the people ate all they wanted. Jesus told his disciples to gather up the leftovers so that nothing would be wasted. The disciples gathered them up, filled 12 large baskets with what was left over from the five barley loaves. So I read this, and I was like, okay, whatever. This is literally, a thing. I praise God, yesterday I, I was going over my notes, and I realized this. Okay, yeah, they got leftovers. That's awesome. But what leftovers did it say it had? 
five barley loaves, or, or had leftovers from the five barley loaves, but not from the fish. So the fish didn't last, but the bread did. So even through what you're going through today, well, everything else in your life, your money, your social status, everything else you may have won't last. But the one thing will remain is the bread, the bread of God, the word of God. God is not only there with you from the beginning, he's there with you through the miracle. And he will be a surplus outside of the miracle. You will walk out of the fire knowing that not only, I don't even smell like smoke. I don't even feel like I was in a fire. God is with me through it until the end. How many can say amen? What are you going through is temporary. We get so caught up in what we're going through, we think that's it. Once again, finish your story. Know who's with you. Know who's been with you since the beginning. Know who can provide. What you're going through is, te is temporary. Your insecurities, your low self-esteem is all temporary. But God, even in this passage, shows that he's eternal. He shows himself in unique and different ways. In the bread, in the unlikely things. No one expected a boy to supply for the 5,000 or to be the source, sorry, the willing one to give to the 5,000. No one expected that. You would think like a baker with a whole bunch of bread would be coming by. Oh, yeah, here you go. I got a whole bunch of bread for you, free. Oh, amen. Awesome coincidence, right? A lot of people say that. No. It was a boy had five small loaves of bread and two fish, and he was the source. And we may be asking ourselves, well, what good am I? I'm just a small boy. I'm just a girl. I'm just this. I'm just that. We count ourselves out. What good are we? Really, what good are we? We got to understand that God is eternal, and God will never leave us nor forsake us. The question has never been if God has been there. The question is whether or not we're willing to lay it down. And that brings me to my last point. Lay everything down down and the band can start coming up we're not necessarily quite quite done yet but the band can start coming up lay everything down and I want everyone to close their eyes right now don't fall asleep I want everyone to close their eyes I want you to imagine this you ready the ground picture this in your head the ground was covered with grass so you see a plant of grass and Jesus told his disciples to have everyone sit down, about 5,000 in the crowd. So the ground was covered with green grass, and Jesus told everyone to sit down on the green grass. As I was reading this, the Lord reminded me of a very familiar passage that resonates with me. And I'm going to read it. For the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So he makes me lie down in green pastures, not only in front of my 5,000, but he makes me lie down in green pastures, even in Psalms 23. So even though it looks like I'm not enough, even though it feels like I'm not enough, the Lord will make me lie down in green pastures. And even God says, I lack nothing. Despite how I feel, despite what it may look like, despite what I'm going through, God says, I lack nothing because he is my shepherd. He makes me lie down on green pastures. Why? Because he is my source. He is my strength. Lay everything down. Lay your problems down. The 5,000, lay them down. Lay yourself down. Lay your insecurities down. Lay your struggles. Lay your issues. Lay everything down. Your possessions, your mind, your problem, yourself. And mentally, we tend to give up. We, 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 we give ourselves up to God, but we don't give up our problems to God. Okay, yeah, here, God, here I am. But your mind is racing on what am I going to do to supply this? What am I going to do to get here? How am I even going to ever? I don't even know what the next question is. I don't know what I don't know, God. I don't know what to do. And so now we have to ask ourselves again, what good am I? I am more than enough. I am more than a conqueror. I am more than what God is, that what people have imagined because God is with me. How many can say Amen. So what good am I? The next time you ask yourself, what good am I? 
I am more than enough. I, yes, I may not look like I have enough, but God is with me from the beginning through the middle and to the end till there is a surplus and an overflow so I could begin to bless others. And we could all stand, we could all rise to our feet. And Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you, God, for what you've done today. We thank you for the word. We believe, God, that you've spoken and you moved in this place, Lord God. Greater than any word that I could verbally express or any, any explanation that I could perfectly demonstrate, Lord God. You are greater. Your words are greater. You are mightier. You are stronger. And we pray, Lord God, that everyone under the sound of my voice, whether online or in this building, God, that is dealing with low self-esteem, issues, insecurities, doubts, worries of where their next meal is coming from, what the next step is going to look like. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that you may begin to show them that you have been with them and you are with them. Lord God, that you be could begin to move in their lives. It may just be an internal work. It may just be a simple work, God, but it is still a miracle, and I thank you for it, Lord God. So I pray, Lord God, that everyone in this room may begin to be willing enough to lie everything that they have in front of you. Lie everything that they have onto you, Lord Father, right with you, Lord God, so they can see you multiply. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, and we worship you, Lord Jesus. God, and we believe in the work that you're doing in each and everyone's lives today. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many were blessed today by the word of the Lord? Give them a round of applause if you were blessed by the word of God today. What good am I? Awesome word, a powerful word. It was funny, last week we preached on the same passage, a different message. But God's word doesn't contradict, and the Holy Spirit aligned us with this word. You got the intro last week, and today God is telling you, what good are you? If you sit down, rest in me, rest on my word, you can be used powerfully by the Lord. How many believe that in the house of God? If you're at home and God is speaking to you because you felt throughout this whole situation, throughout this whole pandemic, that you would just, God just forgot about you, that, that promise that he made to use you, and, and the calling must have been a mistake. Oh, God, how can you still want to use me with all the stuff I done did? But as we heard today, what good am I? God says, if you sit down on my word, if you sit down on your faith that you have in me, and you just let me work in your life, God can still do miracles in you and through you. How many believe that today? Amen. He ain't finished with you. He's still working with you and working on you. So let us get ready to come into the presence How of God. How many were blessed today? How many were blessed? If you were blessed, let's give a round of applause to God, of thanksgiving, of praise, of worship. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of your word upon our lives. So we thank you for being with us today. Brother, we thank you so much. Brother Anthony, we thank you for being with us. We hope it's not the last time we see you. We're here every single Sunday. You can catch the full replay of the full service on our Facebook page, Pop Church English Ministry. If you want to search for us on YouTube, we have our YouTube channel as well. Like us, subscribe. You can find the rebroadcast of the sermons of every service on that channel as well. And we want to just give you the final blessing so you can be dismissed. And guys... We'll see you next week, 9 a.m. Thank you. Can we give a round of applause to David for that awesome word? Thank you, Sister Auda. Thank you. I always save the best for last. You people thought I forgot, didn't you? No. I got my lovely wife, Pastor Dolly, with us here as well. Let's give her an applause, a round of applause. Uh, without her, without God, I would not be doing what I'm doing here. And I thank you for your support. It's never, it hasn't been easy. It has not been easy, but she's been there with us. Hallelujah. Let us be blessed so we can lead. So we're ready. Amen. Most of you guys can say this with me. You probably know it by heart. <laughs> may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord uh, make his face shine upon you. I got it messed up. And have mercy on you. May the Lord raise his countenance upon you and give you true peace. I now bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and the Church of Jesus Christ says, Amen, Amen. We love you. We bless you. Be good. Be blessed. We'll see you next week.
God bless you guys. Hallelujah.